the collapse of the Soviet Union, and the world watched with wonder. The Soviet Union had two basic areas. The Union of Social Soviet Socialist Republics, which is all in red on the map, and you can see the many countries that it covered, along with the Eastern Bloc, which is the yellow countries. And these were the seven satellite countries set up by the Warsaw Pact. Bulgaria, Czech Republic, East Germany, Hungary, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia. Now, there were major differences, just to review, between democratic capitalism and totalitarianism communism. Alright, first of all, capitalism is all about the money. With communism, it's all about everyone being the same, every, everyone working the same, and doing what is best for your country. And the two major things that were running this kind of old-fashioned, we talked about Cold War, were military strength, an arms race, who had the bigger bomb, and of course the technological race of space race, who was going to get to space quicker. Now, did the Soviet Union and, and communism fall due to force? No. That's why the Cold War is called the Cold War. No tanks were fired, no guns were shot, All right, but it did cost a lot of money. Eleven trillion dollars, to be exact. And it was getting very expensive to keep this kind of Cold War going, plus the Soviet Union was suffering financially due to not really working with the we'll say, worldwide capitalism that was starting to take over. But as with any revolution, all right, any massive change in government, it started at home. There was a massive homegrown insurgency of people living in the Soviet Socialist Republics who were not happy. All right, you had workers who weren't making enough, were not being able to take care of their families. You had intellectuals, meaning college-educated people, who were sick and tired of being not able to read what they want to read, write what they want to write, you know, listen to the music they want to listen to. They wanted freedom of speech. They wanted the freedom that democracy offered. And you had a lot of advocates for national self-determination, nationalism at its finest. We've talked about this before. You had a lot of those little countries that the Soviet Union was controlling that were their own independent ethnic and cultural groups, and they wanted their own homeland. And then, of course, you have reformers who just want to change everything. Now, all these people started working together. It all started, though, in Poland with the Polish trade union, Solidarity. The downfall began, uh, began in 1980 when striking Polish workers organized into Solidarity, which was an independent trade union with nearly 10 million members. And they wanted better wages, they wanted better working conditions, just like the labor unions and the early people striking during the Industrial Revolution in the early 1900s. They wanted the basics and the government wasn't giving it to them. Now, along with this movement in Poland of Solidarity, you also had the Polish Catholic Church who was supporting it. All right, there you see a picture of Pope John Paul. He was the very famous pope from Poland with uh, the leader of the Solidarity Movement, okay, Lech Walsall, and I'm probably mispronouncing his name there. But he supported having self-determination for the country of Poland. He supported, you know, the Solidarity Movement, which was to help the entire country with better, you know, conditions all around. Living conditions, working conditions. And, you know, having the Pope on your side is a big deal. Now, Lech Wassel, okay, uh, basically had to move underground because there were death threats against him. The government wanted him gone. The uh, communist government, the Soviet Union, wanted him to disappear. So the Solidarity, uh, they drove underground, turned into a little bit of a military movement. In 1983, Lech Wassel won the Nobel Peace Prize, and in 1990, he was actually freely elected to Poland after more than 60 years of being ruled by the Soviet Union. So, he was quite the leader. So, you'll see him sometimes on the regions. Now, while all this is going on, all right, you have a new leader of the Soviet Union named Mikhail Gorbachev. All right, and that's a picture there on the slide. He came to power in 1985. 
And he recognized very quickly that the Soviet Union could not remain politically and economically isolated from the rest of the world. And that the Soviet system had to change if they were going to stay afloat economically. So he had a five-point plan. All right, and you can see here on this slide, his first was glasnost. Glasnost means openness. He wanted greater freedom of expression. Basically, First Amendment rights, free to say what you want to say, write what you want to write, read what you want to read. So that was a big deal. And then he wanted restructuring and perestroika. This was decentralizing the Soviet economy and very slowly was letting in baby steps towards capitalism. So glasnost, greater freedoms of expression, perestroika, restructuring. You see these a lot on the uh, regents exam. He also did the renunciation of the Breslin Doctrine, which basically armed intervention where socialism was threatened. He said that if people were going to start questioning socialism, questioning the uh, communism, he was not going to send in the army to crush these people, which was a big change from what normally happened. He also wanted to reform the KGB. That's the secret service, the secret police that the Soviet Union had, still has. And, you know, we talked about how they would just, you would disappear in the night. You'd go for a, a walk to get milk and eggs and you'd never come home because the KGB grabbed you. He ended that policy. He also tried to bring more change to the Communist Party. Now, all of this did not happen overnight and there were many... Uh, Soviet members of the Soviet Union government who did not support Gorbachev. They thought he was a little crazy. They wanted to keep the power. But he knew in order to participate in the world economy, we have to start, you know, playing well with others. We have to find a way to bring in some capitalism. The objection of all this was survival. Okay, Gorbachev knew the Soviet Union would have to change if it was to survive. Central planning in a modern industrial economy had, was too inefficient. The factory management system was very inefficient. The socialist farm system was not working. There was not enough food for the people. And they couldn't afford the high defense spending that was going on with the Cold War. They, you know, All their money was going towards weapons. And that's not a good thing if your people are starving. So people the, of Russia, of the Soviet Union, started insistently calling for change. We need to do this. Gorbachev believed that his reforms were necessary and used his leadership and power to implement them. The policy of glasnost made it possible for people to more freely criticize the government. When people realized that it was safe to speak, speak out, then calls for change became more insistent. Once people realized we're really not going to go to jail when we talk about how bad the government is, more and more people started talking about how bad the government was. They weren't afraid anymore. The reforms were too slow. Um, they tried to kind of speed things up. It didn't work. Um, the Soviet Union started to suffer to dear, and with economic and social conditions, and people got very scared about the economy going into a hole that it couldn't get out of. The party reforms in the beginning were a failure. He attempted to reform the Communist Party, but people didn't want to change. We know change is hard, and change can be painful. And it was very hard for the hard communist liners, the hard, you know, people were like, no, we do not want to end communism. We don't want to end our power. With the renunciation of the Breslin Doctrine, where, you know, people now could rise up and the army was not going to shoot them down, a lot of communist rulers in independent states couldn't survive without the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was the big gun. They were the baseball bat behind every guy who, you know, was controlling his area. When the Soviet Union's army wasn't going to show up anymore, then the people started rising up against these horrible rulers and saying... You know, we can take you on now because your bat has been put away. Your big guns are not going to show up. You can see here, now Ronald Reagan was the United States president during this time. And you can see the world according to Ronald Reagan. It's kind of a little funny thing there. But you can see the USSR. And here's the United States. Because we were the big players in the 1980s. In... The 1980s, President Ronald Reagan gave a very famous speech at the gate of Brandenburg at the Berlin Wall. And he said the very, you know, the, it's still quoted today. He said that Mr. Gorbachev opened this gate. Mr. Gorbachev tear down this wall. 
basically saying we need to end communism, we need to work together, and Gorbachev heard it. And here's a picture of him giving that very famous speech in 1987. Beginning in September 1989, a wave of huge demonstrations shook communist regimes across Eastern Europe. A massive tide of East Germans surged into Czechoslovakia and Hungary to the west, undermining the whole authority of the whole Communist Party, who were still trying to hang on. There was a big, big push in Germany to tear down the uh, Berlin Wall and to unite Germany into East Berlin or East Germany and West Germany. Here's a very famous picture of them. They're blocking a train in East Berlin because they want democracy. This is in October 1989. Their banner reads, legalization of opposition parties, meaning other political parties, free democratic elections, free press, and independent unions. All the things that we have here, believe it or not, in America. Finally, in November 9th, 1989, the wall came down. Ordinary Germans poured through the Berlin Wall. They started literally taking it down piece by piece. And by, you know, it was a wonderful party atmosphere. And they tore it down. And by 1990, East Germany had been incorporated back into West German, and they were West Germany, and they were a unified country, which they still are today. And they're one of the strongest countries in Europe. Now, out of all of this came the rise of nationalism. All of those Baltic states, part of the Balkan Peninsula that have always caused issue, well, they still, even here it is 100 years later, almost 100 years later, they were still fighting for the nationalism and their own independent countries that they wanted before World War I. And so now that the Soviet Union was weakening, a lot of these countries were starting to rise up. The people were rising up and saying, we want to be independent. We don't want to be ruled by the Soviet Union anymore. Communist governments in Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Bulgaria either tumbled or underwent reform. Communist dictators in Romania uh, fell. Many of this was very violent with a lot of dead people in the streets. Radicals finally moved into the Soviet heartland, and in 1991, thousands of Russian citizens poured into the streets, basically creating a coup d'etat, saying communism is dead in the Soviet Union. We are now going back to our old name of Russia. The independent republics slowly started separating from the, the Soviet Union and began the very painful process of trying to be independent nations without the help of the Soviet Union. During this time, Boris Yeltsin headed up the, uh, the new Russian Republic. He replaced Gorbachev as president, and Gorbachev found that there was no Soviet Union to lead, he, and he re went into retirement. Still alive today, and Boris Yeltsin has since died, but during this, you know, kind of uneasy time in Russia, former Soviet Union, Yeltsin was the leader. Gorbachev won in 1989 the Nobel Peace Prize. He brought a peaceful end to the Cold War and a dramatic change in his government's economy, though not in the way he had intended. He really didn't want all this dem democracy to come so swiftly. He didn't want to lose control of the situation, and he did. But, you know, it all ended up in the, well in the end. The Cold War was over, brought to close not by missiles and tanks, but by the collective courage and willpower of ordinary men and women which is normally how real revolution happens. Hopefully we've all seen that throughout world history so far. Ronald Reagan was president of the United States during this time, and he had a big play in ending the Cold War. He uh, you know, really was quite tough against the Soviet Union, and with, you know, some said that he inspired people. Others said he was just really tough. But either way, he did play a role in the fall of the Soviet Union. Here you can see the difference in the nuclear stockpiles between 1955 and 2005. It's definitely dropped a lot. Here is a little kind of uh, graphic organizer to show you the collapse of the Soviet Union. And then here is a quick list of the remaining communist countries. Soviet Union, they've all broken up and become independent. A lot of them right now are not stable due to the, uh, a lot of the terrorist movements moving into some of them. Um, most of them, as you can go through these, are not as stable as we want them to be. The only uh, communist countries left are North Korea, 
China, but as we said before, that's and Cuba's on its way out. So that's it.